Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you earn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? Up first is 2009's Pokémon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, full remakes of the second generation of games, returning to the Kansai-inspired Johto region for a whole new dual-screen experience. Following that is the Generation 6 adventure into the French-inspired Kalos region, marking the franchise's first mainline foray into 3D graphics on Nintendo's stereoscopic handheld 2013's Pokémon X and Y. That's right, it's a P-O-K-E-M-O-N party! With Scarlet and Violet coming out this week. This time last year, we decided to discuss Pokemon for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, so it only fits that this is Pokemon Week. Let's talk about some more Pokemon games to finally flesh out, I think, discussion of all of the generations. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think six was the only one we were missing. So yeah, this does it. We've talked about all of them now. Well, we will have talked about all of them now. Until Generation 9. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Joe, do you know which one you are getting? I am getting Violet. I've already uh put in the pre-order to pick it up on launch day. Uh the reasoning is stupid. I want the one. Uh, the legendary whose wheel actually turns when you ride it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because the other one bothers the hell out of me, so I will be getting Violet. You don't want a Flintstone mobile, I get you. Uh, I'm also getting Violet, and I think I'm going to go Sprigatito. Do you know your starter yet? <sighs> Fue Coco so far is the one that's speaking to me, but I need to, I want to see, I don't know if I want to see the final evolutions or not. Because mm. I haven't yet. They've leaked, but I have not seen anything. Uh, but I guess uh, we'll find out. But right now I'm leaning towards the, the Pepper Gator. They are interesting. <laughs> anyway, how are you doing? What are you playing? Man, it's just been Persona 5 Royal. <laughs> uh, right before we recorded, I am to the point where I'm waiting to send the calling card to the casino. Mm, yes. So I'm I'm very, very quickly getting there. Uh doing it the way I've been doing it, I've discovered some like weird crap that I never would have discovered. Did you know there's a book in this game that adds technical attacks? No. Like makes new technical attacks possible? I didn't either, but there is. And it's kind of a pain in the ass to get, but it's there. There's also a book that lets you get the social stat upgrades for every part of watching a DVD. So, like, usually you'll only get it at the end when you finish both parts. This lets you get it for all, for both. Mmm. It's, it's absolutely bizarre. I have maxed out social skills, and that happened in September. Wow, okay. Following the guide helps. It's nuts. Uh, I, it's very interesting, because I never would have discovered some of this stuff myself, ever. Doing it this way at least once is kind of fun and helps my lizard brain, I guess. But yeah, that's literally been all it is. It's just Persona 5, except for sometimes when I take a brief break to play more It Takes Two with Matt. That game is so long, it's like twice the length of a way out. It's bizarrely long for what it is, so we have not finished it yet, but we're working on it. I finished... One of these Pokemon games that we will be discussing this week, uh, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know I've been playing through a Pokemon game that I've been hesitant to say which uh, the last few months. I still can't talk about what it's for, but I'll be able to discuss which one I've been playing and my thoughts on it very soon. Uh, also, I am about, I think, halfway through God of War Ragnarok. Uh, got to... The part that feels like the midpoint when you compare it to a similar kind of moment in 2018. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's like the last big 
world exploration tool, I think, that's needed. And the story is going into some interesting directions. I'm really pleased with it so far. I think it's going to be my game of the year for sure. One of these days, I'll get to it. We'll see. I do want to play it. I've heard very good things. I've, I've seen multiple people having finished it and saying it's very, very good. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some composer follow-up news before we get into all this Pokemon discussion. For all the different composers we've talked about, Throughout the years on this show, I like to follow up, you know, what they're doing, kind of keep some tabs on them, especially when it comes to news headlines in the video game industry. Nintendo announced an Indie World presentation that aired on November 9th. Uh, you know, several things there. Uh, the one that stood out to me was we've got a, a date for Sports Story. That's really exciting. I can't wait to see what the follow-up to Golf Story is. Uh, that's that's going to be great. But for this show... Coffee Talk Episode 2, Hibiscus and Butterfly, pours onto Nintendo Switch next spring. So you get the sequel to Coffee Talk. It's coming soon. Looking forward to it. Uh, the other one that really, really stands out to me personally is uh, we got a release date for A Space for the Unbound, which has been in like almost every Wholesome Direct for two years. And I've been waiting for that game to uh, come out for a real long while. Uh, it is by the same publishers as Coffee Talk. I'm just really, really looking forward to it. It uh, had some problems earlier, because like a month ago, they found out that their publisher was doing some shady stuff. And therefore delayed the game indefinitely. And I'm glad they got through that and they now have a date. And I'm excited to play that one. It looks very good. So... Last year, we talked a little bit about how, like, the Doom Eternal soundtrack release was a mess. Uh, just a giant mess. And then there was a Reddit post from one of the people at id Software, uh, the head of the game, basically saying, yeah, it was Mick Gordon's fault. Well, Mick Gordon put out a giant post on Medium... Uh, essentially saying like, no, that is a lie. It is not my fault. Here is every reason why, and here is exactly what happened. Uh, it is lengthy, it has receipts, and it is damning. And as uh, our friend Matt described it, it definitely feels like he had a lawyer sitting right next to him while he was writing it. I feel really bad that Mick Gordon had to go through all this and talking about how his his career and reputation has suffered because of this and it's it seems like it's not his fault and i just wish the best for him and honestly it explains a lot someone else who is in a kind of falling out uh with their current production work sarah Schachner has announced that she is departing the modern warfare 2 music team uh following some creative differences there it's not too surprising with Activision, Blizzard, and everything that they're going through, but obviously she'll find work. Uh, you know, there's plenty for her to do. She scored the recent Prey movie, which apparently that soundtrack is excellent for that score. It was an interesting post to come across where she's like, hey, here's my statement on why I'm leaving. And it's like, oh, okay. In other news about people having creative differences, but in a weirder, weirder scope. Uh, Chipzel. We've talked about how she's kind of, I'd say chaotic neutral, essentially, uh, on Twitter. Uh, she is a hell of a follow, and you should follow her if you don't already. Uh, she got banned for a little while, <laughs> with all the Elon Musk stuff happening uh, lately. Which is really funny, because that means Twitter's going to stop existing in, like, a month, it seems. But she's just gone, like, full chaos gremlin since then. Uh, even on Instagram. She started posting on Instagram a lot more, because she is also convinced that Twitter... Uh, days are numbered. So... It's just been really weird this whole time on Twitter, but at least Chipzel is there to... Make it a little bit more funny, at least. I love that for her, but yes, uh, what a time to possibly be seeing the demise of a, a massive social media platform in real time. I mean, to be fair, somebody on another podcast I uh, listened to 
kind of pointed out that like our generation's a little bit used to it because we saw so many crash and burn <laughs> uh, in the days before Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and it's just it, like compared to that, it is impressive how long Twitter has lasted and how like international Twitter went. And it'll like as much as Twitter's a hell site, and it is, it's a hell site. Uh, it's also very useful for a lot of people, and so I certainly hope I am wrong, and it does not go away forever, but it, oh, it's not looking good. Mm -hmm. It's been a very bizarre couple of weeks, for sure. The Gears of War movie has new life. It's apparently now a Netflix production, uh, where Netflix wants to produce this Gears of War movie alongside an adult animated series. When we've talked about Gears of War, we've talked about how, you know, Dave Bautista would be perfect for a, you know, real life casting of Marcus Phoenix. And turns out, yep, he's on board. He wants in, posted a video on his Twitter account uh, in full cog armor. Get him cast right now. Part of me kind of agrees that same podcast I mentioned earlier also talked about this, and one of them was like, the time to make this show was like six years ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this feels like striking when the iron is not even remote, like covered in ice. But it, if it's good, it's good, though Netflix does not have the greatest track record with that. They have, like, two examples of really good stuff based on games. It's, like, Castlevania and Cyberpunk, I think? That's it. That's all I could think of. So, who knows? Uh, the Bag of Milk games are on Switch now. Just out of nowhere. <laughs> I That was not on my bingo card. That is not a, a pair of games I would have expected to ever show up on consoles, but they're on Switch now, so if you want to play them and you don't have them on PC, I, I guess, I guess, I went ahead and bought them just to throw some money the devs way as sort of thanks for helping us with the episode, but like, what a bizarre release, like, that's weird, and part of me feels like I summoned it, and I don't know how. <laughs> Go figure just comes out of nowhere. And then finally, as I was playing God of War Ragnarok, within the first couple hours or so, you go to Svartalfheim, and that is the realm of the dwarves. And in the main quest, pretty early on when you get there, you come across a dwarven musician named Rabe. And the the voice sounds a little familiar if you like listen to interviews and things like that. And I'm like, oh, hold on, there's got to be something here at Google online. Yep, not only does Bear McCreary do the soundtrack for God of War Ragnarok, and it's fantastic, but he also voices this character and has a couple lines. You can't miss it. Uh, just a neat little thing that a composer gets a small little little acting role. I, I don't think it's important to the story at all, but it's a neat little cameo early on. Always fun when that happens. I can't think of a lot of examples, but I know there are other examples of it. And it's just fun. All right, it's time to talk about Pokemon. I know we've never done that before. Uh, ever, ever. <laughs> ever. We've never talked about a Pokemon game. So Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver were released on September 12th, 2009 for the Nintendo DS in Japan. And then over the span of like three days in March 2010 for the rest of the world. It was developed by Game Freak and published by Nintendo and the Pokemon Company. What are they? They're remakes of Pokemon Gold and Silver, which were originally released for the Game Boy Color in 1999, with added features from 2000's Pokemon Crystal, which we have actually talked about on an episode, that being episode 55. Damn, that was a while ago. Uh, and look, I know the joke I made earlier, we've talked about so much Pokemon on this show. It's this in Persona that we have talked about ad nauseum. You know what a Pokemon game is at this point. Even if you haven't been listening, like, Pokemon is a known quantity at this point. It's a third-person JRPG with adventure game elements. 
and turn-based battles, and you can catch monsters and use them in those battles. You, you're now caught up on what Pokemon is. So, the story, of course, just like the original games, takes place three years after the events of Pokemon Red and Blue. A young trainer from Johto's New Bark Town sets off on their own Pokemon adventure that will take them throughout their home region to face Johto's gym leaders, climb their way to the Pokemon League, and even face the return of the villainous team, Rocket. And of course, as in the original games, the player starts by picking from the three starters, Cyndaquil, Totodile, or Chikorita, with the starter opposite being stolen by a delinquent who serves as the player's rival. Many features, though, in this remake were mainly brought over from the previous DS releases being Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and Platinum as well, which we talked about those. That was the first Pokemon game we talked about, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Back in uh, episode 19. But uh, these were mostly things having to do with the use of the bottom screen. But the most important feature, at least in my opinion, is the fact that uh, one Pokemon in your party can follow you around on the overworld. Any of them. Any of your Pokemon. Just like Pikachu in Pokemon Yellow. Even now, they've stopped doing this, except for in Let's Go, where they went, like, whole hog into it. Oh, yeah. Uh, they they dived into that super hard in the Let's Go games. But other than that, like, they've kind of just stopped. There's some parts in the Sword and Shield DLC. Uh, this was sort of present in Diamond and Pearl, but in an extremely limited fashion. It was, like, one area and only specific Pokemon. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here, it can be any Pokemon you want, though uh, some larger Pokemon do disappear when you go indoors, uh, like Lugia and Ho-Oh. I know for sure if you walk into like the mid-root buildings, they go back to the Pokeball because they're too big for that area, which I find very funny. Uh, another notable feature, though, is that the game also came prepackaged with a pedometer called the Pokewalker, and... With this thing, you could transfer a Pokemon onto this device and attach it to your belt, or more realistically, from what I hear, uh, put it on the dryer as it's running, and your steps, or the dryer's shakes translated into steps, will provide your Pokemon with EXP as you walk, as well as Watts, which can be exchanged for rewards in-game. I remember having my Pokewalker, uh, and this is back when I was working my first job which was as a server in a retirement home sort of restaurantish meal area. Uh, and so I did a lot of walking for that job. And so I would throw the Poke Walker on the belt and I'd have more experience at the end of the workday. And it was very handy. So this is where I will ask, hey, uh, what are your experiences with uh, Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver? I just recently played this video game. Uh, so I played Heart Gold and went through it all, beat red, the whole shebang. Uh, so my experience with this game is very fresh. And it was interesting to go back and play this game uh, with, you know, newer, fresher adult eyes uh, because I have deep nostalgia and reverence for not only the original gold and silver uh you know at the height of pokemania honestly when those games released and then even for heart gold soul silver i uh, was at the end of my undergraduate college degree uh program and i remember it was fall 2009 and those games were coming out in japan and i got my hands on a rom I'm like, let's let's try playing it. Let's go through it. And of course, when the main game came out, I got Soul Silver. Um, really enjoyed that. It's, they're my favorite Pokemon games. But upon reflection, uh, yeah, thinking about it more, this is the best Pokemon game that represents what it was, uh, because many things about this game I think represent. Uh, you know, it's it's a great coat of polish on a video game from 2000 and they don't do all that much to 
fix some of the problems that the original game had uh, because they don't want to mess up the original experience. So weird things like going from the Team Rocket base in Mahogany Town, you beat Price, the gym leader there, and then whoops, suddenly Team Rocket's taking over the Rocket Tower and it's just like it's not paced well. Um, it's just interesting to think about how there are many things about this game that it's like, well, if you think about that's how it was for a Game Boy game in 1999, 2000 in North America, uh, that explains a lot. And and Pokemon has changed a lot in the 10 years since, uh, mostly for the better. A lot of quality of life improvements. Uh, the biggest problem when you go back and play Heart Gold Soul Silver, especially when you're doing the grind up to the very end of the post game, uh, the grind is you know paced well in the first half until you hit the credits, and then it just kind of stops, and you realize that the Poke Gear phone accessory that you've been collecting all these phone numbers with, that's how you grind against good trainers for good experience. And you get to find the gym leaders and rebattle the gym leaders, and they have better teams and all that. But it's such a big hassle to figure out what, you know, where do you find these trainers? What do you have to do? It feels like a lot of, uh, you know, playground school communication, but thank goodness that the internet exists because uh, that that really helps with it. So overall, I, I love Heart Gold Soul Silver, top five video games all time. But when you go back and play it as an adult now, it's it's like it's the heyday of what Pokemon was. But, you know, for all the weird changes that newer Pokemon games have made, you cannot ignore the quality of life improvements that have been made. So it's a bit of a mixed bag going back and looking on it. So I also bought soul silver back in the day. Uh, I would have still been in high school and uh, I still have the box. Actually it's sitting out on a shelf in my living room. Currently. I don't know why I have saved the box for like 12 years. It's a cool looking box to be fair. It's a, it's a nice looking box. Uh, but it it's there. It's been there for years. I think these are probably up there as my favorite Pokemon games. Nostalgia still puts Crystal at the top for me, even though I know that Heart Gold Soul Silver is a better game. <laughs> um, like I know that for sure, and like Black and White is a better game and all that. But I have not replayed it since I played it the first time. And I put hundreds of hours into Soul Silver yeah. because I had a full all water team. I personally ground each and every one of them up to level 100. Wow. Using only Mount Silver. <laughs> what time you must have had. Boy, howdy. I wish I wish I could go back to that. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, it was... I don't know why I did it. Obviously, I was in high school. I didn't have anything to do except for go to work and then go home. Eh, I don't know. But I do remember that uh, I really, really liked that team. They're they're very cool. It was all water plus uh, Jasmine Steelix, because you can get Jasmine Steelix in a trade in that game, which is hmm. really cool. And I love Jasmine. She's my favorite gym leader. So if I can have one of her Pokemon... Hey, let's do this. But yeah, I haven't replayed it in a very, very long time. Uh, but I, they're up there as some of my favorites, like full stop. So obviously, as you might have guessed from the dates, these were released a full 10 years after the original games. But something I find weird is that they released two months before the actual anniversary in Japan. I feel like. I would have held them off until November, but maybe, like, I don't know. Part of me was was going to say, like, maybe it's just not a great idea to release a Pokemon game in November. And then I re remembered that we're doing this episode because there's one releasing this week in November. I feel like it would have been uh, more sentimental to wait until the actual anniversary. But, hey, I don't work for the Pokemon company and I'm not a marketing guy, so I don't know anything. So, the first priority for the whole team was to make sure that they were respecting the feelings of those who had played the original games. 
people had a lot of memories of gold and silver, and they knew that. And they knew that they had to make sure that those people were still happy, but at the same time, they really wanted to make sure that the game still felt good to play for, say, the people that started playing on the Game Boy Advance, or with Diamond and Pearl. And they wanted to make sure that it still felt good for new players to play. Uh, so, this was a bit of a balancing act. Uh, the Game Freak president, you can actually talk to him in Celadon City, uh, and he actually describes, like, this whole thing in a quote being, quote, what do you think? I am the president here. We are remaking an old game, but this is quite a challenge. Old fans would not want us to mess with their good memories, but there's no point in just redoing the same thing, right? We are working towards something that brings back memories, yet is also completely new. I've been in this business for 20 years now, but creating a game is always a rewarding challenge. But you can always find Game Freak somewhere in, in the games, which I always find neat. Even though in... In X and Y, they're in, like, a haunted building, which is the <laughs> weirdest part. The Pokewalker itself was actually meant to be a spiritual successor to the Pocket Pikachu Color Gold and Silver Together, which is the full name of a device, which was itself a successor to the Pokemon Pikachu. Uh, both of these were, of course, also pedometers with minigames built in. They were basically a Tamagotchi, but with a Pikachu in them. Yeah. Makes sense. And the more steps you took, the happier the Pikachu living inside would be. And those were, of course, released alongside the Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. So the idea was to package the Pokewalker in there and make it something that was similar to represent how much the game's scope had multiplied since the originals. And yet I put an event Jirachi on it. I put it in a drawer and forgot about it. <laughs> That sounds about right. My Pokewalker is lost to time. I don't know where the hell it would have gone at this point. I have not seen it in years. Uh, one thing that is a major change from the original game, and I almost forgot to talk about it. So in the original Game Boy Color games, when you go into the game corner, there's slot machines and like oh, yeah. card guessing machines and stuff. And those are still present in the Japanese version of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, but in the Western version of the games, those were removed and replaced with a game called Voltorb Flip, which is essentially just Minesweeper. Uh, and this was, we don't know for sure, but likely due to the fact that Peggy, which I believe is the European ESRB equivalent, uh, they were getting ready to establish some stricter guidelines on what they considered to be games that would, quote, encourage or teach gambling. Uh, and those games would be rated an 18 plus. And they didn't want that for Pokemon. That's not... Pokemon can't be that. So that is the theory. I did not know that was not, like, confirmed. I've always heard people talk about that as something that 100% is the case. Uh, so, yeah, uh, a lot of people kind of bummed by that change. I'm kind of bummed by that change. Walking into the game corner and there's just like one dude sitting in a chair at a table and that's the whole building. And of course, from there, uh, game corners aren't in Pokemon anymore. They're just gone completely. Uh, which is unfortunate. It really is, because they also changed up the prizes and how easy it was to just buy coins. See, in old gold and silver crystal, I would just you get the coin case, buy coins, and then get an Abra as a prize right then and there. Boom. He's already level mm -hmm. 10. You know, easy to grind up to level 16 for Kadabra. It's not. It's like an Ekans or Dratini and a Porygon. Like, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. You gotta actually catch it on, like, uh, the, the route south of Goldenrod. It's a pain. <laughs> if it doesn't teleport away first. Oh, Abra. Never change. So while researching, the main source that I was able to find was actually an Iwata Asks about Heart Gold and Soul Silver and what led up to their development. Uh, and one part of it uh, really kind of made me smile. So 
one of the people being interviewed was, of course, Sunikazu Ishihara, uh, one of the heads of Pokemon Company now, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he was with Game Freak at that point, but I believe, yeah, he is now at Pokemon Company. And he mentioned that the new recruits that were joining Game Freak at this time were actually the people who would have grown up playing the original Gold and Silver, which, that's a dream job. And this quote really stood out to me, being, quote, That's why, when you talk with them about the new games, you'll see their eyes shining with excitement as they ask you, We're going to get to do that again? Things have come round full circle since that time when they were at their most impressionable, and they really feel they want to give it another go. So, like, the idea of growing up on Johto and then you get to remake Johto. That sounds awesome! And especially because the man who made that possible with Gold and Silver and made, especially with the back half of the game, to make it as memorable as it is, Satoru Iwata made that possible mm -hmm. with miracles in programming so uh yeah it's it's it is remarkable how you could get to come and work on that and have it be full circle and then also have iwata still there at the time the late satoru iwata rest in peace but uh i can only imagine at the time that's got to be a really cool feeling absolutely so these games obviously reviewed super well i mean they're pokemon games back in like I, not Pokemon's heyday, but still pretty big. Uh, it has an 87 on Metacritic. It, one of the only major complaints that critics seemed to share was that there were no major surprises to be found within the game, which, I mean, guys, it's a remake. What do you, one of the reviews mentioned, like, it doesn't do anything innovative. It's like, yeah, it's a remake of a Game Boy game. What did you expect? Uh, it was a weird, a weird criticism, but I, I guess I can sort of see where they're coming from. I don't know. The Heart Gold and Soul Silver are often ranked highly on the list of best games of the franchise. Uh, nowadays, it changes with the tides and with kids growing up. But nowadays, I want to say people either give it to Black and White or Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Those are the two that people tend to to juggle as the two quote unquote best Pokemon games. And Heart Gold and Soul Silver, I feel like, is like at least regularly in the top three. Uh, mm -hmm. So it has that going for it. Some people put it one, number one, but it's at least high up there. Yeah. Uh, within two days of release in Japan, the game had sold 1.48 million units. And within two weeks, that number had risen above 2 million. Uh, and within a month of releasing in the U.S., it had collectively sold 1.73 million copies. This is where I'm going to ask, uh, which one do you think sold better in the United States? Heart Gold. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Uh, Heart Gold sold a total of 0.76 million in those first two months, while Soul Silver sold 1.01 million copies in those two months. So. Soul Silver was the the higher selling version. Did people not want to get in touch with their feelings? Like, like games got heart in it. I don't. I don't like that. <laughs> I mean, I granted we say this both as people who bought Soul Silver, but come on. Most of the time, I feel like people buy the first game, like the the first uh, between the two. I feel like the second one often gets uh, shunted a little bit. I just like Lugia better than Hello. That was literally my reason as a kid. <laughs> That's fair. Lugia had a movie. ho -Oh didn't. As of September 2017, though, uh, both of the games collectively have sold a total of 12.72 million units. So, they, uh, they were still selling for a while. The only award that I could find that this game won, though, was the Golden Joystick Award for Portable Game of the Year in 2010. Apparently, it was the first Pokemon game to ever win a Golden Joystick. Ever. Hmm. So that's interesting. Uh, and as for its legacy, I mean, Pokemon continued. Give me a 3D Johto game, please. Preferably not a Let's Go Johto. Yes, I would like to add that addendum as well. <laughs> uh, I feel like a lot of the neat new things that Let's Go Johto did have kind of moved its way into 
Legends Arceus and now Scarlet and Violet with the the open world exploration and seeing the Pokemon on the screen and if they're shiny you get to see them uh, you know things like that or the the navigation with the boxes and you don't have to go back to the PC like you can just do it out in the world oh it's the, the best change possible it's so good 100 <laughs> percent. and you know then we look at things like you know the the change to hms and tms and what they've done with it uh, fantastic i feel like let's go was a neat little idea especially a couple years after the launch of pokemon go to kind of experiment with that go back to kanto and look at it in a new way but i feel like johto wouldn't work as well with it it would be really neat to have a 3D Johto game. Uh, you know, maybe if they take another crack at the Legends format and if they want to do something more with that. I think it would work really well for that. Seeing as seeing as Johto is like heavily built upon mythology and stuff. Bell Tower, like let's go like the, the Tin Tower and do all that. Yes, 100%. Yeah, a hunt that's that's I think what I would most prefer, but I'll just take a straight remake. I don't know. I would take a remake in the style of uh, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, to be perfectly honest. That wouldn't be the most preferable, but I would take that. All right, let's talk about the composer that we're going to talk about today, which you might be thinking, how have you not talked about every single human being that has touched a Pokemon game yet? To which I'll answer, genuinely, I don't know. Uh, So... His name is Takato Kitsta, but he also just goes by the stage name Takuto, which is just his first name in all caps. That's literally all I can find on the man. That's it. Not even his blood type. Hmm. I feel like we make that joke every time, but it's it's actually surprising when you can't even find that. Uh, in terms of his discography, he mainly seemed to serve as a performer on image soundtracks for a real long time, specifically for the series of Ogre Battle and Magical Drop near the beginning of his career. He also seemed to be a performer on the soundtrack for a game called Suiko Embu, which I'm not familiar with. VGMDB puts his first composer credit on the game Skull Fang, which again, I'm not familiar with. It looks like a shooter not like a first person shooter but like a spaceship shooter uh, just judging by the box art he was also apparently in a ranger on kirby and the amazing mirror because i did find out that he did work for hal laboratories for at least a little bit uh, but not for long apparently and then of course he is credited as a composer and arranger on pokemon heart gold and soul silver so the original tracks for the game were, of course, composed by a bunch of people, almost all of whom we have talked about on this show, being Go Ichinose, who we talked about in episode 19, Junichi Masada, episode 42, Morikazu Aoki, episode 55, Shota Kageyama, episode 89, Hitomi Sato, episode 147, and Satoshi Nohara, whom we have not talked about. And of course, the soundtrack was arranged by Go Ichinose, Junichi Masada, Murakazu Aoki, Shota Kageyama, Hitomi Sato, and instead of Satoshi Nohara, Takuto Kitsuda. Uh, and one thing that I that I enjoy and appreciate more as an adult is there is an item called the GB Sounds that you can find in game, and it will set the game's soundtrack to the original Game Boy Color chiptunes which is always neat when they include that kind of thing in a game oh what the heck i didn't find that i want to now look up where is this where is this gb sounds item i think i found it as a kid because it sounds familiar i feel like i knew it existed before now but i don't remember where it would have been maybe in the game freak building yeah it seems to be a thing that's been in a lot of the pokemon games since uh, Heart Gold Soul Silver, which is in uh, Celadon City, so yes, probably in the Game Freak building. Mm-hmm. That, that's what I figured. All right, let's get into the Critical Five now. I'm gonna say up front, I put together a weird Critical Five. Let me explain why. I kind of was looking at tracks, and I wanted to sort of highlight like what changed the most because we talked about pokemon crystal we've talked about a good amount of like the actual 
the gym leader battle theme and the trainer battle themes and all that. But I wanted to sort of focus on the songs that I feel sort of reflect the biggest changes from the originals. So we're going to start with critical track number one. This is one I don't think changed super hard, but gave it just more of a cheerful atmosphere. This is Goldenrod City. I just, I really like the personality added to this. It was composed originally by Junichi Masada, and this version was arranged by Shota Kageyama. And it just gives it this bouncy energy, sort of. Uh, it feels very representative of Whitney in a lot of ways, I think, because she is the face of Goldenrod. And it, it just kind of feels like it's, it's the big city, but it's like a nice big city. As long as you don't go underground. Don't go underground if you want to keep that illusion. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just think it, it isn't the biggest change on the soundtrack. We'll talk about those in a second. But for the most part, I just feel like they brought the personality of the city itself out more in this version. And I appreciate that a lot. Getting to Goldenrod City is such a good moment uh, because you've kind of experienced the first couple small towns. And then like this is big city time in a region that doesn't have many big cities but you know i feel like when you get to the region's big highlighted city uh you know that's always a, a neat representation of how are they displaying this and of course with later technology become more and more impressive but uh goldenrod was always a neat one back in the day and to hear the playful bounce in this one is is a nice touch uh for when i have played this game on emulator and you know to increase the playback speed of the game it's <laughs> nice to even hear this one sped up even further uh just the infectious melody carries on we've talked about before how the bicycle theme is just a different take on goldenrod city uh so it's it's a melody that has lasted throughout time but critical track number two i think might actually be my favorite town music in the series uh, it is just fantastic, and I think the biggest change of all of the town songs, this is Ecritique City. The original was, of course, composed by Go Ichinose, and Go Ichinose also did the arrangement for this version. Wow! <laughs> what a change! Uh, adding it and putting it into, like, these traditional Japanese instruments when Ecritique is the city that is the most steeped in lore, like, probably next to Blackthorn are the two big ones. Uh, but, like, that's where the Bell Tower and the Burn Tower are located. That's where ho -Oh and Lugia used to live. That's where the Kimono Girls live once you've found them all. It's, it's just this really, really neat take on this song, and I don't remember which, but, like, Ecritique in the original shares a song with another town, and they're both just the same track, but this one really, really sets Ecritique apart, which I think is important for a town that may not be important story-wise, but is very important lore-wise. Good pull, you're correct. Uh, Ecritique shares its theme in the original Gold and Silver with Cianwood City. So, uh, that's, that's an interesting choice, but yeah, this one, to really show the expanded range of instruments that were available on this DS sound card, uh, yeah, for a 
Japanese company like Nintendo. We've always talked about how like they really seem to replicate Japanese instruments best on their sound cards. And like this is, you know, the purest example of that. As I think about and talk about this game and its soundtrack more, it makes me think about how it feels like there is such reverence for this soundtrack. Uh, many great themes that were just distilled into 8-bit chip tunes back on the Game Boy Color. And when you've had years to think about how you could expand and grow on these tracks, like this is the perfect way to approach Acritique City. And it's a wonderful choice. So I don't know which town specifically this is based on. We talked about it with Crystal, but Johto is based on the Kansai region of Japan, which is uh, further south, I want to say, uh, which is where Kyoto and Osaka and Nara and a bunch of other like major cities are located. Uh, I want to say Ekritik is probably Nara? Maybe Osaka? I don't think it's Kyoto. I know that for a fact. But yeah, it's just uh, such a good change. I, I really, really, really like this song a lot. Critical track number three, though, I think is the biggest change in the entire game. Uh, it might not be one of my favorite tracks, but do you even remember what the National Park theme sounds like in the original? Probably not. But they sure went hard in critical track number three, National Park. Again, this song was originally composed by Go Ichinose and arranged by Go Ichinose. And just taking what was just sort of a, a fine song in the original game that I can never could never remember the melody to, and giving it like this peaceful, nice piano to play the whole thing and building it to be like this serene almost landscape of like music and sound to be the national park of all things which you're probably not sticking around him very long uh, i know i don't i stopped doing the bug catching contests when i was a child i don't know something about this one really jumps out at me when i'm thinking about like what what really changed in heart gold and soul silver's soundtrack there is real beauty here. And you're right. National Park is such a, you know, hit and miss, just, you know, blow right by that kind of location. But this theme will make you stop and listen. And what way to do that by throwing on a 15 second intro to the main melody that, you know, the old Game Boy one just starts. Da 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 da. Mm -hmm. But you throw on this like 15 second intro on this one. It's just pure virtuoso performance stuff here. Just remarkable. Uh, this is a really good standout. And I'm glad it's here on the Critical Five. This is a really good choice. Yeah, having that intro is, is weird, especially since 15 seconds is probably less time than it takes for you to get on your bike and ride out of the national park. Yeah. All right, so the two main sort of courses, though, the two main characters of this Critical Five start here. There are two completely brand new battle themes that were added to Heart Gold and Soul Silver, being the legendary battle themes. They finally got their own songs. Uh, Suicune was the only one with uh, his own song in the original, and then Entei and Raiko shared a song, if I remember correctly. So. The first one we're going to cover is Critical Track number four, Battle Lugia.
The song was composed by Go Ichinose. So, like, I like Lugia better as, like, a Pokemon, as a design and all that. This isn't my favorite of the two, but something I really, really like, which is a really odd but interesting choice, and I never would have thought about it if not for, like, YouTube comments way back in the day. Uh, it is written as if you are fighting a sea monster, which you kind of are. Like, Lugia is this, like, sea bird that is at the bottom of a cave. It, it feels like you are fighting the Kraken in, a, uh, in another RPG. <laughs> <laughs> But, I don't know, it's a good song, it's just not my favorite out of the two. I feel like I've read somewhere that, like, Go Ichinose is, like, most proud of this one. That it feels like it's the most ambitious song at the time that he had worked on, and uh, it was, you know, he's super proud of it. I agree with you that I like the other one more, as just a traditional Pokemon legendary battle theme. But there is something epic and dark to this one. And I don't think we include it on the clip here, but right at the beginning had these kind of like water bubbles in there that mm. kind of represents like, yeah, the descent into fighting this sea beast. Uh, it's, it's a really cool track with it feels like dark stakes to it. Yeah. Which is weird. Cause it's just Lugia, <laughs> 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 but the other battle theme that was added to heart gold, soul silver, one of my favorite battle themes in the series, to be perfectly honest. This is critical track number five, Battle ho -Oh. Composed by Go Ichinose once again. Ah, uh, I don't know what to say about this song other than it's awesome. Uh, the percussion is absolutely incredible. Just the instrumentation is really good, especially for a DS song. And just bringing it in like that more like traditional Japanese feeling thing, even though it's not fully that like. The, the bass is not exactly a traditional Japanese instrument, but it does a really good job of sort of bringing across the majesty of ho -Oh and, like, the legendary nature of this creature that is revered by the mythology of Ecrotique City. Uh, and it's just such a cool battle theme in general. It is excellent. Also, Ho-Oh is a tougher fight. He's got a better move set at level 40. I'm just saying. Uh, but yeah, wow, does this capture the feeling of Ecrotique City and its environment and traditional Johto and everything wrapped into it and gives it that legendary feeling. Um, this is one that stands out where I feel like if you compare it to some of the legendary themes over time, uh, even ones that we may discuss, in X and Y, the instruments may sound better. You may get a, a broader sense of, you know, the soundscape and all that. But for what was possible on Nintendo DS, this is primo stuff. Also, I just feel like this song has a lot more personality than a lot of other legendary themes. Yeah. Like, it, it is ho -Oh's theme. Uh, and also, having the taiko drums do the percussion, which I don't think any other theme in Pokemon does is just a great touch. It's really good. <laughs> so, so well thought out and well done. So for tracks on the cutting room floor, we both got a couple. Peter, hit me with yours first. So hard to put a couple here, especially when I wasn't necessarily thinking about like what changed the most, what I liked the most. I mean, I have thoughts like, oh, I like the you scene theme, but I brought that to the cutting room floor. Uh, during the Pokemon Crystal episode, so it's it's not the same. A couple more that I'll bring here, though. The first one of these is Battle Johto Gym Leader. <laughs> Wow. 
one of the best battle themes, at least at the beginning part of this game. Uh, we've talked about before how like you really enjoy the wild Pokemon battle theme in the Kanto region as just something to mix it up. But there's something about the gym leader theme in the Johto region of, yes, these are the gym leaders. Prepare for them. Like You have the heightened stakes here and uh, really gets the energy going well with the opening fill and then doom -ba -doom -ba -doom -ba to the base kind of going into it. <laughs> it's just a really, really energetic battle theme that uh, has always stood out to me. And it's been interesting to, you know, go back and, and play the game recently again and get hyped all over again. Also, you know, seeing some of the YouTube comments here and people like uh, all the comments about Whitney and her mill tank. And then I was, I was doing some other reading and I came across like a meme where people were like, you realize that you have a Machop that you can trade for in Goldenrod City that is a female Machop, like <laughs> literally designed as a hard counter to Whitney and her attracting Miltank, right? Yeah, but I'm a stupid kid. I don't know where that is. <laughs> exactly. So it's just interesting to see things like that. It's like, oh, yeah, I guess like that was an option in case it got too difficult, but I don't know. I think uh, Claire is the, the bigger roadblock with her Kingdra, but that's just me. I've always had more problems with Kingdra than with Miltank. Last time I did a Nuzlocke, it was Morty's Gengar that ended Ooh. it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have a, a normal type for that one, because at least in HeartGold SoulSilver, like, <laughs> you throw a normal type out there and uh, the Gengar doesn't know what to do and can't hit you. Yeah. Unfortunately, with a Nuzlocke, sometimes you just don't have a choice. Well, okay, I'll take I'll take that back. I'll add an addendum to that. Have it be like a Pidgeotto or something, and throw out Sand Attack because it'll try to sucker punch. Ah. And then, like that's the only thing can hit. But if you're doing Sand Attack, it's trying to sucker punch and it's failing, and then it's missing a lot of attacks. That's Pidgeotto Eevee, the Eevee that you know Bill uh, gifts you. You know whatever works, whatever works. That's true. I'm I am I pretty sure in that run I was like wow Whitney's mill take is like not as hard as I thought it would be <laughs> right right it's it's interesting when you kind of go back and it's like the things that you know burned you as a child because yeah Whitney's mill tank as a child in the original gold and silver for sure but yeah not not so much when you grow up the other one it would just feel wrong not to include this song but it's also really impressive how it got modernized up and this would be battle champion. Because they are battle themes, the original for both the Johto Gym Leader and for the Champion Battle Theme are composed by Junichi Masuda. While the Johto Gym Leader theme was arranged by Shota Kageyama, this one was also arranged by Junichi Masuda. And so definitely a retrospective look on his own work and to see how he could improve it. And boy, did he. I think there's something to be said about the simpler 8-bit tracks and how it delivered the drama and the tension way back when. Oh, man, especially when you get to those those big encounters. The simplicity of the tracks, and it still brings uh, all of that exciting tension. But now that you have more options and more instruments to flesh it out, the drama is still there. And it's just uh, really brought out. Even, like, the electric guitar that comes in, just... Bam, 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 just really really neat and uh i could not not mention this song what i'm gonna say is gonna shock and alarm people i don't really like this version of the song mm. I, I i don't hate it but like to me the original game boy version is untouchable like just the perfect pokemon battle theme i love it uh, and this version, I feel like, adds a little bit too much, though I do agree, like, the electric guitar is a nice touch on that part. That is that is really cool. But yeah, it. I remember when I played this as a kid, hearing this song and being like, oh, that's not, it's not as good. Okay. I don't know. It, it's really weird that I don't really like this version, because it's my favorite song of the original game. <laughs> 
For my two tracks on the cutting room floor, I picked two really weird out there picks, but they're two that have always stood out to me for some stupid reason. The first one being, and this is the most out there one, Buena's Password. First of all, every time I think about Buena, I just remember if you talk to her during the rocket takeover, her dialogue is, what's the, what's today's password? It's help! <laughs> it's, it's great. The original song was composed by Morikazu Aoki, and this version was arranged by Hitomi Sato. This is one of the radio shows that you can listen to on your Poke Gear. Don't mess up the trivia game to get your radio card now. Yeah, don't, don't do it. Uh, I'm pretty sure I failed it multiple times as a child, which is really funny because you go back to it as an adult and it's like, this is the easiest quiz on the face <laughs> of the planet. <laughs> uh, it, I, I just really like this song. I think it's a lot of fun. It's some cool, energetic piano. Uh, and the radio is something that I, I miss. I wish Pokemon would do that again. I think it would be fun. It would be an especially neat way to bring back tracks from other generations in a way, and kind of create your own little playlist. But, you know, a, a trainer can dream. I personally prefer the Game Corner slash Lucky Channel theme, if I'm, you know, picking one that it's like, oh, yeah, that's the radio theme of choice. But this is also a really fun one, and uh, it's a great little energetic, bouncy uh, arrangement here. I like it. Just as long as neither of us are talking about what's the 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 March... One. Oh yeah, that song sucks. <laughs> it's not very good. <laughs> uh, I would not listen to that radio show. Uh, another one that uh, when I played it the first time, super stood out to me because it was kind of a shock when it came up. There's really no other song in Pokemon quite like it. This is Cinnabar Island. So when you show up on Cinnabar Island in the second half of the game while you're exploring Kanto, uh, it's gone! Because in the three years between Red and Blue and Gold and Silver, the volcano erupted and demolished the city. There's a Pokemon Center there now, I think, and that's the only building that is there. I want to say in the original Gold and Silver, it's kind of just silent, or it might still have the root music. But in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, it is this very, very somber music box theme. Uh, the original, of course, was composed by Junichi Masada, and this version was arranged by Hitomi Sato. Even as a teenager, this this kind of hit me as like, a, oh, I'm sad now, which is not something I'm used to feeling in a Pokemon game. We wouldn't really get any other sequel experimentation until just a couple of years later with black and white two, but all the way back in gold and silver, when they're making the next Pokemon game and they think, well, it's gotta be a sequel. What cool things can you do with it? And this is a perfect representation of that. And I love how they just kind of played that up even more with this theme to take Cinnabar Island's energetic theme from the original game and just get yeah, distill it to, the simplest bare bones memories of surfing up and down the right side of that Cinnabar Island. Um, but yeah, a lot of neat things that they try with, you know, being a sequel here and it's just expanded in this remake. Uh, good stuff here. And that's, it's a nice pick. I, I don't know how many people would have put that on the cutting room floor, but I respect the game. And then you find Blaine who's been living in a cave for who knows how long. Just, yeah, he's just taking up residence at Seafoam Islands. 
<laughs> he didn't even have a house. He's just sitting in a cave and like maybe somebody will find him at some point to battle him. I don't know. Also, Blue's there on Cinnabar and he's like, damn. All right, time to go back to my gym. Man, did you know everyone's dead? Anyways, see you, kid. I'm going back to, <laughs> back to Viridian City. Yeah, it, this is just one that's always stuck out to me. Another one of those out there picks. So what will I never forget about Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver? I don't know. I just like it. I don't think there's anything specific that I can say other than I just, I like it. Uh, it was a big part of, it was probably the DS game I played more than any other DS game humanly possible. Uh, and it, it's just, I don't know, it was a big part of my teenage years. So I am grateful for that at the very least. Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the Pokemon games that represent the apex of what Pokemon used to be. Pokemon, I feel like, plays pretty differently in several regards now. But as as far as you're talking about like old Pokemon games, this is the best of those. I think it might even be the best remake. Uh, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are also very good. But when you compare what this came from, it's still bound by a lot of the restrictions of that original 1999-2000 video game. But... What it did with it is remarkable. And there's a lot of reverence here. It's so good. Hey, also, did you know that uh, Silver, your rival, is canonically Giovanni's son? Yeah, this game confirms it. <laughs> That's weird. You get to meet Giovanni, although I didn't get to in my playthrough because it was tied behind a Celebi event. So, yeah, I don't think I, I, I think I had to learn that from Bulbapedia, probably, statistically. <laughs> But yeah, there's there's like some hidden side dialogue you can find that pretty much confirms that Silver is Giovanni's kid, which is neat. It's a really neat little thing that they did not need to add. The last mean rival. Yeah, we haven't had one since. Wait, kind of with Bade. Bade is, a, is close. He's still not mean enough. I need meaner. Yeah, but I feel like Sword and Shield didn't have like... The one traditional rival, like Marnie's more of a rival than Bade is. Bade is more just like a, an annoying side character who is too cocky. Like Silver's outright a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> like, let, let's be real. The first thing he does in the game is rob <laughs> Professor Elm. <sighs> Depending on when you're playing in broad daylight, perhaps. True. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, Gladian sort of also has that, but like even in those games, like how is really more your rival? And in Sword and Shield, I guess Hop is supposed to be your rival, even though mm -hmm. who cares? <laughs> um, yeah, I want mean rivals back. I want my rivals to be mean to me. Bonus points if it's a she. Anyways, for our transition, we like to cover a fan remix, a fan cover, something like that. When I talk about Pokemon, most of the time, man, I gotta go to the, the classic Poke Remix studio. It's just, it's where I gotta go every time. And he did what I think is a kick-ass remix of the Johto Gym Leader battle theme uh, that really keeps that tension in line and just sort of ramps up the energy. And uh, I really dig it. So please enjoy that. Let's look at that running time on the episode. All right, yep, more Pokemon. Let's do it. We love talking about this franchise, and it's a good one to continue. Let's get that final check off of the generations before another new generation comes out. Let's talk about Generation 6 with Pokemon X and Y. Pokemon X and Y was released on October 12th, 2013, on Nintendo 3DS. They are the first Nintendo published retail games to have a simultaneous global release in all key regions. 
Good job, Nintendo. You finally did it. It just took you a long time. X and Y are developed by Game Freak and published by Nintendo and the Pokemon Company. We have discussed already what a main series Pokemon game consists of, that third-person JRPG with adventure mechanics and turn-based battles. You catch monsters, you battle with them to raise them, you defeat the region's eight gym leaders to work your way up to becoming the new champion of the region. Pokemon X and Y is considered Generation 6, following the Black and White and Black 2 and White 2 games on Nintendo DS. These games take place in the French-inspired region of Kalos, and it introduced 72 new Pokemon species. It included new features such as the new Fairy type, the first type since Gold and Silver with Steel and Dark. There's also character customization, Sky and Horde battles. Oh, I don't miss those at all. The super training mechanics, Pokemon Ami, the player search system for online interaction. And it is the first game in the mainline franchise to have completely rendered polygonal 3D graphics as opposed to the sprites used in previous generations. This generation's gimmick like we'll have terastalizing soon for Scarlet and Violet, it is Mega Evolution, a new form of Pokemon evolution that can only happen once per battle, and then it's only done after the battle. Uh, you can further evolve many species of already fully evolved Pokemon, and there are 30 of these evolutions available in these games. What is the plot of Pokemon X and Y. Let me tell you, it's pretty forgettable. Uh, the protagonist of the game, which is canon named either Calum or Serena, has just moved into a small town called Vanneville Town. Or is it French? Is it like Vanivy? I, I don't know. Vanneville Town with their mother. They soon befriend four trainers. There's Shauna, Tierno, Trevor, and their rival, which is the other protagonist. Still very friendly protagonist, but if you're a boy, it's the girl. If you're a girl, it's the boy. And all of these friends are called to meet Professor Sycamore, who is a smoke show of a professor, and he's the leading uh, researcher in the region. Uh, he's based out of Lumio City, the main city of Kalos. And the player receives either Chespin, Fennekin, or Froakie as their starter Pokemon. So they begin their adventure, they learn of Pokemon gyms, as well as the mysterious Mega Evolution. Continuing their journey, the player encounters the villainous Team Flare, whose goals at first seem to be geared towards making money off of Pokemon, but their true goal is the annihilation of humanity to return the world to a pristine more beautiful state. What a generic wahaha destroy the world. Big questions here. Can you stop Team Flare? What does the mysterious nine foot tall man known as AZ have to do with the ultimate weapon that Team Flare seeks? And can you become the champion of the Kalos region? Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Pokemon X and Y? To say the plot is forgettable is generous. Those are generous words. Team Flare is the worst villain team the games have ever had. Like, bar none, I can't think of any that have been worse. Yeah, even Team Yell is better. Yeah. I was about to say, I'll take Team Yell over Team Flare any day of the week, even though they suck too. I don't know. I'm kind of cold on X and Y nowadays. Uh, I haven't replayed it since I played it the first time. Uh, and I will be for Smash Pieces at some point because of Greninja. And I, I can't name exactly why I feel this way, but it kind of felt half-baked mm -hmm. when it came out to me. Like, it felt like it needed more time in the oven for a lot of reasons. I forgot about AZ's existence until you literally just mentioned him. Which I shouldn't be able to forget the nine foot character 
who's a giant, a literal giant. But there we are. Uh, I don't even, is it Lysandra? Lysander, yes. The, the, the leader of Team Flair. It is such a stupid plot. I do like Sarita at the very least if she's your rival. Um, I don't know how Caleb is as your rival. I assume he's the same, but with the pronouns changed in dialogue. Who knows? Uh, but I do know that Sarita would go on to be like what is considered one of the best characters the anime has had in a very long time. 100%, yes. Like, I've, I've heard she is fantastic. It's a game that in my brain sure exists. I don't hate it. I don't love it. It just is. Which one did you play, and who was your starter? Uh, I believe I played X, and uh, uh, who was my starter? I think I picked, oh, Fennekin, because I really like Brakeson a lot. Brakeson is one of my favorite Pokemon designs. Uh, Delphox is fine, but Brakeson is, is great. So that, that I at least like. It gave me one of my favorite Pokemon. I also picked Fennekin, but I played Pokemon Y. Uh, so yeah, my experiences with this game, it's, I think it's the only Pokemon game that I've played once. And that's kind of weird to think about. Like, at least I've given like, oh, maybe I give X a try and see how it's different now. Like what, what is there to return to in these games? Honestly, the better gen six experience is Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. If we're talking about like what's offered there. Uh, so yeah, X and Y is, is just weird to, to think back on and like, what did I like? What? What was really good here, uh, and it was it was interesting to kind of look into this game and think about it, and also you know when we talk about Scarlet and Violet coming up here, for it to be inspired by Spain, well, what borders Spain? It's France, and there are theories when you look at like the Paldean region map, like there's the upper right corner that kind of looks like a a wintry area, and that's kind of like the border with. Kalos, ideally, if you think about it. So I don't know if we'll ever get some you know, references in, in this game, this upcoming game to, you know, the Great War and all of that. Cause there's also the theory of like it split the timelines into one where mega evolution exists and then one where it doesn't. Uh, it, there's just weird stuff about this game. But on the whole, yeah, X and Y is not that memorable, but it was neat to kind of look into. Uh, for a couple of reasons, because uh, development of Pokemon X and Y began in 2010, which followed the release of Black and White in Japan. The team size grew by about 50% in the transition from a 2D game to a 3D game, especially for all of the 3D models of the 721 Pokemon that would be uh, included with this game. There were more than 500 people that were involved with development, but this also includes all of the localization teams that pushed for a worldwide launch in several different languages. Director Junichi Masuda, hey, we just mentioned him, remember? He's he's the guy who started as the composer for the original Pokemon game and then like became the brand representative and director. So he revealed that the three main themes of X and Y were beauty, bonds, and evolution. The titles X and Y make sense because they represent the Cartesian axes with the X axis and the Y axis. Apparently, this also reflects different forms of thinking, but this idea was chosen early in development. And so it makes you think, if there's an X axis and a Y axis, what about a Z axis for a game that is going into the third dimension? What do you mean? AZ is right there. We just finished talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Junichi Masuda gave the answer of, oh, oh, we wanted to surprise fans like we did with Black and White 2. And so when the 20th anniversary of the franchise came up in 2016, we just decided to go with a whole new generation in Pokemon Sun and Moon. And that's Generation 7. But this doesn't account for the fact that Pokemon skipped 2015. And when they were in their path of like yearly releases, at least in North America, you know, 2013 was X and Y, 2014 was Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, skipped 2015. That would have been the game for a similar Black 2 and White 2 game uh, if we make the Generation 5 comparison. 
Well, in fact, data miners would eventually later discover that Game Freak had internal placeholders for two follow-up Kalos games, like what happened with Black 2 and White 2, and eventually Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon for Generation 7. I'll point you in the direction of Did You Know Gaming on YouTube. They have a really good video about this. But the prevailing theory seems to be that Game Freak was working on something at the time called Gear Project. And this was a highly prioritized focus at Game Freak to try to come up with another game, a new IP that wasn't Pokemon, but would take off like Pokemon. Not only would this be something new and fresh for the team to work on, but it would also be something that they would own 100% because of the right splits with Nintendo and the Pokemon company. So as a result of them prioritizing this so much, some of Game Freak's top talent was working on some of these new games instead of Pokemon. These would be games during the 3DS at the time like Harmonite, Pocket Card Jockey, and Tembo the Badass Elephant. I forgot about that last one's existence. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So as a result, uh, this could be, you know, manpower away from the Pokemon team, uh, not you know enough work to come up with a possible sequel. So yeah, there were no second Kalos games, no second Gen 6 games there. Because you also in 2015 had the Pokemon XYZ anime launch. And usually those games have a really good track record of promoting with the anime and having that all time up. So the anime was ready to go and show off the different forms of Zygarde, uh, but the games were not there. It could have been really cool too, I think, if you called these two games Pokemon XZ and YZ, and you could have stylized the Z to look like a two. Just a thought. It would have been real neat. Uh, just saying. While these games are based in a region inspired by France, overall European culture influenced the design of the games. Did you know for the main legendaries in this game, they're based on Norse demigods? Weirdly enough, I think I did know that. <laughs> uh-huh. So, Aikthemir is a stag which stands upon Valhalla, and that is represented by Xerneas. Hreisvalg is an eagle-shaped originator of the wind, and that's represented by Iveltal. And Nithog is a dragon who gnaws at the roots of the world tree Yggdrasil, and that would be Zygarde, at least in its final worm dragon like form so that's pretty neat I, I didn't know that it's it's not all french things here and there it's just like european uh, influence as a whole pokemon x and y were announced by the late satoru iwata through a nintendo direct on january 8th 2013 in the promotional lead up to the game mega evolution was highlighted with mega mewtwo y in a special episode of the anime and mega charizard x in the Pokemon Origins animated side series. When the games launched, they reviewed well, with Metacritic averages of 87 for X and 88 for Y. I will ask, why does Y have a higher Metacritic score? They're really the same game. That's very baffling. Critics praise the innovations and advancements in the gameplay with the new generation, the visuals, and the transition to 3D models. But the game's story, the characters, the linearity, as well as frame rate issues in 3D mode, uh, these all received criticism. Over 4 million copies of the games were sold worldwide in the first weekend, making X and Y the fastest selling game at the time on the Nintendo 3DS. This would later be surpassed by Pokemon Sun and Moon. As of March 31st, 2022, though, the games have sold 16.62 million units worldwide, making them the second best-selling games for the Nintendo 3DS, behind Mario Kart 7's nearly 19 million, and just ahead of Pokemon Sun and Moon's 16.28 million. 
The game was nominated for Best RPG and Best Handheld Game at the 2013 VGX Awards and the Dice Awards. If you're wondering what won those categories, Nino Kuni won Best RPG at VGX, while Diablo 3 won Best RPG at the Dice Awards, and The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds won Best Handheld Game at both. It won the Golden Joystick Award for Handheld Game of the Year. Of course, the legacy of X and Y. Generation 6 continued with 2014's Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, which we covered a year ago in episode 147 of Original Sound Chat. 2016's Pokemon Sun and Moon, which we talked about on episode 118. Uh, This reimagined the path to becoming a Pokemon champion, and it also appeared on Nintendo 3DS to mark Generation 7. Generation 9 launches this Friday with Scarlet and Violet taking us to the Paldea region. Please be good. (laughs) Please be good. I have pretty high hopes. It looks pretty neat so far. Although I wonder what's going to happen with the whole uh, level scaling and the reports that it's not. They talk about, you go to any of the gyms, you pick your own order. But if the gyms have a set level order, then what's the point anyway? We'll find out. I I don't know how well they're going to do an open world Pokemon game. The composer that we'll talk about this week for Pokemon X and Y is Hideaki Kuroda. Hideaki Kuroda was born on March 5th, 1982 in Tokyo, Japan. He has a blood type of AB. He graduated from the University of Tokyo Faculty of Agriculture, and he got his master's in conservation ecology. That's a pretty good backup plan, but he still worked in the game industry, working on various games in Hewn X from April 2007 to March 2010, and Procyon Studio from April 2010 to May 2013. He went freelance as a composer in 2013 and was hired by Game Freak. He has also gone by the alias Ale? Ailey? A-I-L-E. Ale. Ale. Uh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> According to his website, quote, he specializes in world music style, influenced mainly by Irish and Scandinavian music, playing and recording himself with a wide variety of instruments including folk instruments such as Irish buzuki and cantele, as well as guitar and bass. He put out his first solo album, Toki Shirube, in 2016, where he is credited with performing vocals, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, electric bass, keyboard, Irish buzuki, mandolin, pedal steel, cantele, accordion, glockenspiel, tin whistle, and programming. So a lot going on for Hideaki Kuroda. You can follow him on Twitter at Hideaki Kuroda. His discography includes some video games, as you'd expect. The ones I recognized started with Shiren the Wanderer, The Tower of Fortune, and The Dice of Fate, where he worked on sound. He did sound effects for Kid Icarus Uprising. And then his work at Game Freak started with Pokemon X and Y, where he worked on sound effects, Pokemon voice design, and he's credited with playing guitar. He then worked on Pokemon Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, Tembo the Badass Elephant, Pokemon Sun and Moon, and then a couple more recent games include Rolling Gunner Over Power and Super Bullet Break, and he composed music for all of these. The Pokemon X and Y soundtrack has music composed by Shota Kageyama, Minako Adachi, Hitomi Sato, and Junichi Masuda. There is also credit for originally composed tracks, which were brought into this game, and those go to Morikazu Aoki, Go Ichinose, and Satoshi Nohara. So a lot of names coming all together. As I mentioned, Hideaki Kuroda is credited with guitar performance. This was the first usage of the Nintendo 3DS's sound capabilities for the Pokemon series, and Masuda expressed delight over the improved sound quality and the expression that was now possible. You weren't bound to the sound cards and the rigid programming there. Similar to the theme of X and Y themselves, 
This game's music was designed to emphasize beauty, and that would be also represented in the region and all that, but they didn't want to make it too obvious that French music was a source of inspiration. <laughs> so there were times where they had an accordion planned out, and then they're like, ah, let's just use a Japanese harp instead. Cowards. Yeah, right. Of course, there are still some tracks that have accordion. We'll, we'll get to that. But uh, they, I guess they had more at one point. A four-disc Super Music Collection album is available on Apple Music. And when it launched, the digital soundtrack debuted at number 104 on the Billboard 200. It peaked at number five on the Billboard soundtracks chart. All right, so now that the chains are broken and unleashed, what does the 3DS allow for Pokemon music? And let's get to these five critical tracks for Pokemon X and Y. We start with what I think is the big one. This is Battle Trainer. This is the big one. I feel like when this game is represented in other games, other forms of media, let's say Super Smash Brothers for Wii U and 3DS, for example, when it's revealed that Greninja is a playable character, it's with this song. Like, this is the one. As you'd expect with a battle theme, it is composed by Junichi Masuda. And I'd like to think that Hideaki Kuroda is performing that electric guitar there once the melody kicks in, because that is a nice sounding electric guitar. That's like recorded well, no longer held back by, you know, basic instruments. Uh, that's, that's some good sounding stuff here. There's a lot of, you know, synthy stuff still here, but that sounds like some good electric guitar. Yeah, I, I really like this trainer battle theme. It's one of the few things that I can remember off the top of my head about X and Y, mostly because of the Smash inclusion, which the Smash remix is phenomenal. Uh, but the original song is also very, very good. Uh, I especially really like the intro. I just like the intro a lot. 100%. I don't think we get to the in the clip, but even later in the piece where it's the mm -hmm. like, oh, it's it's so good. When you're in the moment and you know, the wild theme is okay, but one of the rare examples of a game where like the trainer battle is like, that's the one that really gets brought to the forefront as what people remember the most. A neat track here. Uh, when you go to different parts of Kalos, one that stands out and kind of just hits you, uh, at least for me anyway, uh, this one here, number two on the critical five, this is the Kalos power plant. Power Plant's a pretty important location early on in the game, and this theme just starts as you enter the building, and it just strikes you. And I feel like, I remember listening to this, and it's like, this is like different than any other Pokemon song I remember hearing. I like it a lot, especially you know later in the clip, where you get some of the, the strings coming in to support. Uh, it's it's really cool, but yeah, a lot of neat synths, the kind of doobie 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 doobie, -doo, the kind of bouncing around there. Uh, good vibes for you may not necessarily associate with a power plant. I mean, maybe you think electricity, you might get like some zapping sounds in there, but it's a really chill, laid back groove uh, that gets you and strikes your ear. This is a palace theme. 
Yeah. From Persona 5. This is a palace theme. This sounds like something I would hear in a palace. I don't know exactly what it is, but just that's the first thing that came to mind when the song started up. Uh, but no, it's it's surprisingly good. I did not remember this song whatsoever, but I'm glad you brought it because it's, it's got a good groove to it. I dig it. Very different for most of the themes that you'd hear in a Pokemon game. Usually there is a route track that stands out. And for me, number three on the Critical 5 for Pokemon X and Y, this is Route 15. Route 15 is kind of near the north part of Kalos, and I feel like we've had Route 10 stand out in black and white before, so usually there, there's one theme that you're you're on a path and you're battling trainers and wild Pokemon and things like that, but uh, this one is pretty impressive. I will say the trumpets are still MIDI, and that's not the best. But it's a nice, triumphant fanfare. And you love to hear that as you are pushing your way towards the end of the game. So this is one that, you know, uh, many good root themes throughout Pokemon's history. But I feel like this is the one that I'd like to point to for this game in particular. It feels more like the overworld theme of a traditional JRPG, which is, is neat. To hear, I don't know why it's in Kalos of all things, but yeah, it's it's got this really sort of dramatic flair to it, and it feels more fantasy than I'm used to Pokemon songs sounding. So it, yeah, it, it stands out. This is pretty good. You know, Team Flare may be just a colossal disappointment, but you know what doesn't suck? The final boss theme for Team Flare. Number four here on the Critical Five for Pokemon X and Y. This is Battle Lysander. Surprisingly, for a battle theme, this one is composed by Minako Adachi, hmm. which kind of makes sense uh, because of her work in Pokemon Sun and Moon. I feel like there's a lot of groundwork here with some of like the futuristic kind of tacky instruments that would eventually make its way into the hip hop grooves of Team Skull battle themes and your boy Guzma. But anyway, here was like the start of that and. Yeah, Lysander, or God, I don't know how French you want to go, Lysandre? Like, how, <laughs> how do you want to say? Lysander is not a great villain. Uh, motivations, terrible. Shocking red hair. Uh, bizarre. He's got that goatee going on. All right, good for him. But, you know, the music for his battle stands out. Again, you know, the Team Flare battle music, not the greatest. But this is one that, okay, all right, man, like, I'll, I'll listen to what you've got to say because you've got this theme carrying you, doing a lot of the heavy legwork. Yeah, carrying is, the, this song's back must hurt from how far it has to carry Lysander. I like, especially in the intro, like, the glitching it does, yep, like it's yep. skipping. I think that's a really, really neat touch. Um, Just in general, I'm not a big fan of the Team Flare battle melody i still can't believe that of all things got a remix in smash but 
it's held back by the fact that I associate it with Team Flare, and therefore, like, my immediate thought is, oh, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, this game has a pretty decent end game, though. I'll, I'll give it that. And it's capped off by our number five critical track here for Pokemon X and Y. This one, of course, is Battle Champion. the game with the champion that's like a peacock lady yeah it's diantha and her mega gardevoir that gains the fairy typing and that one's nasty that's a huge special attacker uh this one's neat and you kind of hear like the da 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 like little chimes that kind of go back there give it a little bit of a lighter air it's nowhere near like the iris champion theme and you know black two and white two uh, but there's a kind of elegance here while there's also the big stakes for a champion battle. Is it near the best champion themes in the franchise? No, but it's nice to show the potential on this soundtrack and uh, the team starting to work with bigger expanded potential for what could be done with the Pokemon soundtrack. And I think it's a nice way to cap it off. Yeah, this is admittedly a very good champion theme. I think this also got a remix. In Smash, I'm pretty sure, to go along with, you know, the Kalos Pokemon League is a stage, <laughs> so I guess it makes sense that there's quite a few X and Y songs in there, but, uh, yeah, it's it's really good. I especially kind of like the da 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 back to happy. It's really weird. I, I dig it. This song goes some places, and I, I like most of the places it goes. Totally, totally agree. All right, for tracks on the cutting room floor, Joe, you have two. Hit me with them. Literally one of the only places that I remember in the entirety of X and Y. The only town I could name off the top of my head, not only because it became a smash stage, and also because I spent the most time there. That would be Lumios City. I don't know why I like this one uh, a good amount. It was composed by Shota Kageyama. Uh, it's just the theme of the city. Lumios is Paris. Like, just straight up, it's Paris. Yes. And, I don't know, this song sounds like a Leighton song. In a lot of ways. Like, I feel like I could I could be exploring the streets of Paris as Herschel Leighton during this song. It's It's bizarre to hear. You just need some accordion coming in. Da -da -dun -dun -da 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 -dun -dun -dun. <laughs> and every time I hear it, just screw having to navigate Lumio City. Oh, they it's knew the worst. what they were doing with the taxi crap and you have to pay for that. They knew what they were doing. I mean, yeah, it's a big city, but we talk about, you know, Goldenrod coming off from Heart Gold Soul Silver. And you know, Castellia, even in uh, black and white to represent New York City, but this little wheel spokes design, no, 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 stop, confusing. It's just, it, it, it's impossible to find anything, and you, you know they knew it was impossible to find anything because the taxis exist. But it's the City of Light. And then, uh, my other track, you mentioned the, uh, the second most attractive Pokemon professor, Sun and Moon, <laughs> would like to have a word. Uh, <laughs> This is Professor Sycamore's theme. Here's 
Here's your Leighton. Yeah, this is also Leighton as hell. <laughs> because there's there's the accordion. There could have been more of this sound team. You gotta stick to your guns. But they didn't want too much French. This song is like, but what if we made the most French man there's ever been? Uh, and they did it. And I don't know, I dig this song a lot. I also like the, the violin in there. The violinist in me enjoys it, but it's mostly, it's the accordion. It's, it's great. I'm really glad you picked these because, uh, yeah, it was tough to leave off of my list before passing it on to you and be like, hey, I hope you get to include some of these. Uh, and then you sure did. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. Because for me, I've got a couple more battle themes that I feel like have to be mentioned when we talk about this game. And the first of these on the cutting room floor is Battle Successor Karina. This is composed by Junichi Masuda, who wanted to try a new approach with this battle track. And so for the gym leader theme, he added techno themes, <laughs> which you can tell by the which is kind of annoying to hear in the game. Uh, I pick out this successor Karina one because I think it's is the third gym leader battle that happens surprisingly later than it should, but it's like, you know, bigger stakes. You're learning about like, Oh, there's mega Lucario. And uh, you're kind of learning about mega evolution more together with this gym leader. But at the same time, it kind of gives a little more heightened stakes as results compared to the normal gym leader theme. So that's why I chose this one instead of just battle gym leader. Anyway, it's weird <laughs> to get some, techno stuff here but when you get like more in the main chorus and you get the chords coming in with the synths it's it's some nice sounding stuff there but yeah um x and y sure is a time with did this also get a remix in smash i, I we're going to like look up what actually did get remade in smash like i i i hearing this and i'm like i've heard this recently where the hell else would i have heard it uh, Corinna is probably the only character you can name, and I'm like, oh yeah, her and her stupid Lucario. Mm -hmm. That's and I remember what she looks like, even, which is not something I can say about just about any other character in all of X and Y, except maybe Tierno, because I don't have an answer for the question as to why that one would be <laughs> the case, but it is. All right, and Smash Ultimate. They got a uh, Wii U and 3DS remixes for Battle Trainer Battle and Battle Team Flare. The originals for Battle Wild Pokemon, Lumio City, Victory Road, and Battle Champion all made it directly into Smash uh, without any remixes for X and Y. Hmm. So successor Karina wasn't one of them. Where the hell did I hear this song recently? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, maybe you'll also wonder if you've heard this one recently, also on the cutting room floor for me, is Battle Xerneas and Eveltal. This is one of my favorites on the soundtrack, and it's composed by Junichi Masuda. I feel like it also captures the uh, legendary stakes. You got like this, like kind of thunder crack at the beginning. It's it's pretty neat, uh, and a long build until the boom, 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 kind of punches in with the main melody here, played on guitar, which I believe fans also think is Hideaki Kuroda performing on electric guitar. So that's a neat touch. I just didn't want to include it in the Critical 5 because I felt like we already had plenty of battles. Uh, but this is a neat one. I feel like it's, uh, you know, better than a couple others, uh, you know, related to legendary Pokemon at the time. So 
maybe on the grand scheme of things, it's pretty forgettable, but I kind of, you know, bought my head listening to this one. It's like, oh yeah, this is a pretty good legendary battle theme. And it kind of makes me feel similar ways about, you know, the, the Lugia and Ho-Oh battles and what they were trying to accomplish. Generally, yeah, I agree. This is, this is pretty good. Man, the more I look at them, Xerneas and Eveltal are designs that were kind of wasted on this game. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're really, really good designs. I like both of them. Xerneas has at least been in at least one of the side games as a major player. That's true, yes. So he's gotten to do something since then. I don't know about Eveltal, maybe him too, but Dark Bird Man, not so much. <laughs> But like they're both really good designs, and uh, I'm sad that they're stuck behind the Pokemon game that holds the least amount of real estate in my brain. So what will I never forget about Pokemon X and Y, uh, like you just allude to? <laughs> there is plenty that I've forgotten about this game. But it's certain tracks. Like, I knew Battle Lysander had to be on here, even though Team Flair and his plan is ridiculous and sucks and is dumb. But he's got a great battle theme. Uh, Kalo's power plant is one that has weirdly stuck with me all these years. And, yeah, I mean, the battle trainer theme takes me right back to not only all the trainer battles in X and Y, but that, uh, you know, Greninja and Charizard reveal trailer for Smash Wii U. That, that... That really stands out for sure. Very much so. Uh, I mean, the main thing I remember about X and Y is the buildup before it came out. Because I was super hyped for these games. Most people were because it's like, holy, Pokemon 3D? 3D yeah. Pokemon? Yeah. What? Uh, and I do think it was a good stepping stone. I don't really think they nailed the look until Sun and Moon. And then I don't really think they nailed the gameplay until Sword and Shield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it, I think. <laughs> but this was, it was very obvious that this was their first foray into making a 3D game of this type. Uh, but I, I remember, weirdly enough, like, what job I was working when this game came out. I was working at a donut shop, like, two days a week, and it was the worst job I've ever had. And... Uh, I remember that I had to go to the bathroom a lot during that job, mainly because, uh, people, I don't, I can't stand that for very long. And I had to just go into a quiet area and my manager assumed that I was going into the bathroom to go play Pokemon. <laughs> when in reality, I hadn't even picked it up yet for the record. Uh, but those are the main things I remember about it. But just the, the build up and excitement towards Pokemon's finally 3D. It's about time. It sure is. And it's going to continue this week as we'll both be picking up Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I mean, we'll both be playing Violet, but it's going to be a time for Pokemon fans all around the world. Very exciting. And with that said, that'll do it for Pokemon Week here on Original Sound Chat. That'll do it for us. Thank you for listening. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at String Pixel. The video version of the show is on the Rhyme Cetacea YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want. That's hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. That's where Joe's other podcast, Smasher Pieces, is hosted. And you can find Smasher Pieces and Original Sound Chat wherever you get your podcasts. Podcast catchers all around the globe. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even on Spotify, where we have a feed of podcast episodes. We also have a big Spotify playlist, where if we talk about a video game track on this show, and it's on Spotify, it gets added to this big monster playlist. I normally ask Joe what's being added this week, but... These are first-party Nintendo games with Pokemon, so I'm guessing they're not there. But if you got Apple Music, check out these soundtracks there. Yeah, they they seem to... Pokemon Company seems to 100% be in on we will only put our music on Apple. Like I don't even think they're on Apple Music. I think you still have to buy them over the thing. They're not on streaming, which is weird. That's the only place you can get them ever, still. Yeah, it's so bizarre. When you're done listening, you can find the show on social media at SoundChatOST. Leave some feedback for us. How are you doing with these episodes? Also, give some suggestions for games you'd like us to cover in the future. Joe, what are we talking about next week? 
Well, next week is our 200th episode, which is a lot of episodes if you really think about it. And we will be doing the best of the 2010s, which you have been helping us prepare for for like a month and a half. So we hope you enjoy what came out of it and uh, look forward to it. Thank you so much, listeners. It's been a real delight to make that happen. We can't wait for you to hear the final result. All right, to play us out, let's find a fan cover, a fan remix, whether it's on YouTube, OC Remix, wherever. Found uh, Toxic X Eternity, which I feel like has been a while since we've talked about his music on YouTube. And he did a cover of Lysander Battle featuring Thunder Scott. And you know what? If there's one track that's a banger in this one, it is that Lysander Battle, I think at least. So why not get a cover of it up in there? And that's a good one. Thanks so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>